this video we are going to be looking at the important events that happened during Holy Week on Thursday, Friday, and of course Sunday. In the map that you see before you, we're going to start with what happens on Thursday evening, where Jesus, first of all, goes to the upper room, a place uh, secured by him and his disciples to share the Last Supper together. The place that we're going to be visiting together is the Last Supper room on Thursday night. It's located on your map in the bottom left-hand corner of the City of Jerusalem map as it looked in the first century. The events of Holy Thursday uh, in the life of Jesus begin in this, uh, begins in this general location. We are standing on the, uh, the roof of a structure uh, that um, is certainly not the structure where Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room on Thursday night of Holy Week, but it may be pretty close, and this current structure may, according to some archaeologists, it may be built on the foundations of an earlier structure where Jesus uh, celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. Uh, let me read from Matthew's Gospel that particular story from Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were sorrowful, began to ask him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, uh, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this, of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. So we are in the general location of the Last Supper, held in the upper room in a, in a home that perhaps, perhaps is the foundation for this structure that now is commemorated as the Last Supper house, called the Kenicle. Now we're walking into the Kenicle or the upper room. This particular structure it dates back to the Crusader period, but it has some older elements in it as well. Here I'm pointing at a pillar that has pelicans on it. Pelicans in early Christian art is important because it was believed that the female pelican would pierce its breast, uh, causing it to bleed and then uh, to feed its young uh, the blood, which of course, as you might imagine, uh, was picked up in early Christian art uh, because uh, the pelican then came to symbolize the person of Jesus who offers his blood as a ransom for many. Now you should remember that um, the upper room or the kenicle 
is uh, dates back to the Crusader period, uh, but after the Muslims uh, recaptured this structure, they turned it into a mosque, and so as you walk around the upper room, you'll actually see some elements that are Islamic, some elements that are Christian, and so, for example, we'll look off to the left here and we'll see in Arabic uh, some uh, Islamic text. While this particular building is Crusader, it uh, stands upon the ruins of a much older Byzantine structure, which uh, causes many to believe that this is indeed the general location, all not, although not exactly the same room, the general location of the upper room where Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. So this is the kenicle or the upper room. After instituting the Lord's Supper in the upper room, Jesus took his disciples with him and they went east. If you look at our Jerusalem map, you'll see that Jesus went east. He crossed the Kidron Valley and then stopped at the foot of the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can see the Garden of Gethsemane on your map on the upper right hand corner. And here is where Jesus spent some time in prayer, asking some of his disciples to come with him, although they fell asleep. And this is also where Jesus is arrested. So let's go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now we are walking across the Kidron Valley, along with Jesus, and making our way to the foot of the Mount of Olives, where the Garden of Gethsemane is. Here we are looking south, south across the Kidron Valley. You can see how lush and green it is in the spring. Palm trees, olive trees. Off in the distance, uh, you see the rising Mount of Olives. On the right-hand side, we even see the Temple Mount. But now as we begin to focus in, we're looking now, just coming into the screen, the Garden of Gethsemane Church, or it's called the Church of All Nations. And this is the place that commemorates where Jesus spent time in prayer and where Jesus was arrested on Thursday night of Holy Week. And now join with me as I walk into the Garden of Gethsemane. And as you look with me off to the left, uh, we see lots of olive trees, some of which are hundreds of years old. Uh, this remembers the place, of course, where Jesus spent time in prayer, bringing Peter and James and John with him, although they fell asleep. And this also commemorates the place where Jesus submitted his will to the Father and took upon himself the cup of judgment at the cross. Well, here we are outside the Church of All Nations, uh, also the Garden of Gethsemane Church. After Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper uh, up on what is today Mount Zion, he brought his disciples uh, down here across the Kidron Valley and into the Garden of Gethsemane, or the Garden of the Olive Press. The church uh, just behind me uh, and the um, uh, olive tree grove that we just walked through remembers the place where uh, Jesus uh, prayed uh, and ultimately um, submitted his will to the Father's will. And I'd like to read that passage of scripture here with you, which also includes uh, the part of the story where Jesus is betrayed and then arrested. This is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, beginning at verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. 
And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour's at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. He came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. So all of that which I just read took place in this general proximity, a place remembered by the church just over my shoulder, the Church of All Nations, the Garden of Gethsemane Church. And so Jesus then is arrested in this place uh, and he's taken across the valley once more over to Caiaphas's residence where he is there held for the first uh, part of his trial on that Thursday evening of Holy Week. Now join with me as we walk into the Garden of Gethsemane Church, also called the Church of All Nations, built in the 1920s. Actually, it's a rather recent church, but built over top, like many of these churches are, over the top of the remains of a much earlier Byzantine church. This church uh, tends to be uh, uh, low lit, it's dark, because of course it remembers the place on Thursday evening of Holy Week where Jesus went to uh, wait in prayer, where he, in, uh, in praying to his Father, asked that this cup might be removed, but ultimately Jesus uh, submitted his will to the Father. In the very front of the church, there is a large stone structure, limestone, in the very front of the church. And this is where I'm going at this point. And it's often uh, traditional for folks to go to the front of this church and to kneel at the stone, which is the traditional place where Jesus knelt to pray to his Father. And so I'm doing the same, going to the front of the church, kneeling and praying at that stone and a wonderful mosaic picture of Jesus. After Jesus was at the Garden of Gethsemane, as we know, he was arrested. He was taken first to the home of the high priest Caiaphas. And it's here where Jesus was imprisoned. It's here where Jesus actually uh, was questioned. And it's also here in the courtyard of uh, Caiaphas's house, where St. Peter denied Jesus three times, all before the rooster crowed. So come with me now to a church called the Church of St. Peter at Gallicantu, which remembers the home of Caiaphas the High Priest. We are now at the Church of St. Peter Gallicantu, and uh, the word Gallicantu in Latin means the rooster's song. So uh, this is the church that commemorates the place where Jesus is brought after he's arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, he's brought to the, the house of Caiaphas. The church that is behind me is uh, a place that remembers where it is that Jesus was, um, uh, was held in prison uh, in the household of Caiaphas, the high priest, and where the, the trials of uh, that Thursday night of Holy Week took place. It's also 
This church commemorates the place where Peter got close enough uh, to see where Jesus was, but at the end of the day, as you know, uh, Peter denied Jesus three times. Let me read the story of all of this from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Jesus was following him, or Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you an answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them, saying, I do not know what you mean. And then when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. This is Matthew chapter 26, beginning at verse 57. And these uh, things happened. Uh, pretty good chance in and around this location where this church remembers where Jesus is held in the house of Caiaphas, and also where Peter denied Jesus three times. After Jesus is arrested, he's taken, as you know, to the household of Caiaphas to be held and imprisoned. This is on the other side of the city, actually, on the uh, western side of the new city. We, uh, we actually have a first century road that archaeologists have exposed just outside the church of St. Peter at Gallicantu. And now we are panning from right to left, coming up the valley towards St. Peter Gallicantu Church, the actual stone street that Jesus would have been taken after he was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane and brought up to Caiaphas's house. Rather steep stepped street that Jesus was brought up and then imprisoned. At the very top of this first century street, there is a wonderful sculpture that captures the moment of what it might have looked like as Jesus is being brought up the steps to be placed in prison in the house of Caiaphas. As we go into the lower level of the church of St. Peter at Gallicantu, we uh, encounter a small um, chapel that's built over top of the prison that was below the courtyard of Caiaphas, uh, archaeologists believe. And what's fascinating here is uh, there's actually a chiseled hole that leads down into the prison room. You can see an inscribed cross 
there that some archaeologists believe dates back to the Byzantine period, the cross that's inscribed, but the hole there is very, very old. And in the front of this space, you can see a picture of what it might have looked like as Jesus was lowered by rope into that prison. Now we're actually below the church, and we are looking up. We're looking up through the chiseled hole in the ceiling, which was in the floor of the shrine above, that commemorates the space where uh, many believe that this is the place where Jesus was held in the household of Caiaphas in the prison down below uh, as he was interrogated uh, by Caiaphas and, and others. As we look up, we can even see some more of the chiseled crosses that are Byzantine. After Jesus is interrogated by Caiaphas and the other priests and scribes, he is sent off to meet with the governor, Pontius Pilate. There's much dispute about where Jesus' interview with Pilate took place, but uh, one most likely, uh, most likely view is that Herod, Herod uh, the Great's palace is the location where Pontius Pilate was located. If you look at your map here of Jerusalem in the first century, Herod the Great's palace is in the center left of your screen. Herod the Great's palace there, of course, by the time of the trial of Jesus, Herod the Great has passed away. And now Pontius Pilate, who is the Roman governor, comes and uh, meets with people, uh, completes government business, most likely at the old palace of Herod the Great. And so that's where Jesus meets with Pontius Pilate. We are standing uh, right now outside the, uh, the current uh, walls of Jerusalem. Uh, and these uh, current walls uh, that are behind me, you can see them behind me, are built over much earlier walls. Uh, these would be the uh, outside walls, generally, of uh, Herod the Great's palace in Jerusalem. And uh, so this is most likely the general location of where Jesus was uh, held in trial before Pontius Pilate uh, here in the space behind me. Uh, archaeologists have identified a monumental uh, walkway that comes up right past where I'm standing and leads uh, right up into this area uh, where there uh, near this place was uh, an ancient door in the wall uh, where Herod the Great uh, could come out and uh, speak with the people. Remember, uh, Jews in the first century were concerned about ritual purity, especially around Passover, and so their interaction with, uh, with uh, Pontius Pilate, who was a Gentile, would have needed to be uh, somewhat um, limited. And so we are standing, most likely, in the general location of where uh, Pontius Pilate interviewed Jesus and held him on trial and then brought uh, where Pontius Pilate brought Jesus out to to speak to the crowds. So let's read this passage. This is from Matthew chapter 26, uh, the story of uh, Jesus and Pontius Pilate from Matthew's Gospel. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two of you 
do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd and saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, see to it yourself. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed on his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, they put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. So all of that that I just read from Matthew chapter 27 took place right here in this, in this general location, this area right outside of Herod the Great's palace, which then was used uh, less than a generation later by Pontius Pilate as his headquarters when he interviewed Jesus and ultimately condemned Jesus to death and washed his hands of the death of a righteous man. Luke's Gospel tells us that after the first meeting with Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate realizes that Jesus is from Galilee, and it just so happens that Herod Antipas, uh, the son of Herod the Great, is in town. Herod Antipas is the uh, leader, the king of the Galilee, and so Jesus is sent for an audience in front of Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas most likely uh, set up shop uh, in the Hasmonean Palace, and if you look on your map, the Hasmonean Palace in the first century during the time of Jesus is right in the center, right in the center of your map. So Jesus is taken there from Herod the Great's palace and Pontius Pilate. Right, here we are at uh, the Western Wall. This is the plaza, the large plaza that stands before the Western Wall, the famous Wailing Wall uh, here in Jerusalem. If you look off to my left, see the western wall. This is part of the retaining wall structure built by Herod the Great in the first century during the time of Jesus. Up on top of the platform is where the Jerusalem temple stood. Now, uh, as you know, we are working our way through the story of the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus. And uh, where we are right now is very close to the general location of where the Hasmonean Palace would have been. The Hasmonean Palace uh, is the place where Herod Antipas uh, would have been residing during the time of the Passover and the trial of Jesus. If you look off in this direction, generally in this area, we're not sure exactly where, but in this general area is where the Hasmonean Palace would have been as described by, by Josephus. Now, this is important, this location because uh, Luke's Gospel tells us that in the middle of Jesus' audience with uh, Pilate, Pilate comes to realize that Jesus is from Galilee, and of course Herod Antipas is the, the king, uh, the son of, uh, of Herod the Great, given responsibility over the Galilee. So Pilate sends Jesus to have an audience with Herod Antipas. Luke's Gospel records that for us in Luke chapter 23. Let me read the story here where, uh, where Pilate sends Jesus off to Herod Antipas. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate, and they began to excuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in him, 
But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up all the people, teaching throughout all of Judea, from Galilee even to this place. And when Pilate heard this, he said whether the man was a Galilean, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, that's Herod Antipas, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendor, splendor clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with each other. So, uh, part of that trial of Jesus taking place here in this general location, the Hasmonean pa uh, Palace with Herod Antipas. Since we are here already, let's walk down to the western wall and uh, get a glimpse of it uh, here together. The western wall, as you may know, is actually not part of the temple itself, but the western wall is part of the rectangular retaining wall the massive rectangular retaining wall that went around the Temple Mount. The rectangular wall, the Temple Mount, built by Herod the Great in the late 1st century BC, early 1st century AD. This is a holy place in Judaism, and so all men that go to the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall have to wear a yarmulke or a kippah. And so, out of respect uh, to those folks, uh, who hold this place in such high honor. I've donned a kippah and going to the Western Wall uh, to say a brief prayer. Uh, this is very important space for Jews because it is uh, the closest spot that uh, an Orthodox Jew can really go uh, to where the uh, temple was in Jerusalem. So after Jesus meets with Herod Antipas, he's sent back to meet with Pontius Pilate back at Herod the Great's palace. And as we know, uh, he is sentenced to death. So Jesus then is brought from uh, Herod the Great's fortress, his palace, uh, and he's taken then to Golgotha, uh, which is north and just a little bit east of Herod the Great's palace. If you look at your map, uh, you can see on the map that uh, Golgotha or Calvary is just a little bit north and to the east of Herod's palace. And you'll even see that in the first century, uh, Golgotha and the Garden Tomb, for that matter, are both outside, outside the city walls of Jerusalem in the first century. We are now standing in the uh, small plaza that is in front of the current day entrance, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This was not the original entrance of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's gone through a couple of different, pretty significant destructions uh, over time. Uh, first, when the Moslems came through uh, in the seventh century AD, they uh, um, really um, uh, damaged uh, this, this cathedral, this church that was built in the Byzantine period by Helena, uh, the uh, mother of, of Constantine the Great. And then again, uh, when uh, the Crusaders uh, lost this location to the Muslims again, uh, there was significant damage done to this church. So, so there's a lot of rearrangement. It's not nearly as large as it was in its original state, but it's still quite uh, large. We're standing again right now in the plaza of the current day entrance into the church. And you're going to follow me along as we, first of all, go into the church. We're gonna make a right-hand turn and go up into what looks like a balcony area, but it's really a large shrine that's built over what is understood to be uh, Calvary, uh, Golgotha, the place of Christ's uh, crucifixion. We're gonna pause there and uh, take a look at that location. Then we're going to come back down uh, and head in the direction of the tomb itself, the edicule or the small chapel 
that is built over top of the current day tomb. So come on, you can follow me. As we head into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you'll see just how old the columns look, just how old the doors look. Uh, this is an incredibly old uh, building. It's uh, dark inside. It's um, quite dim, dimly lit, because it is quite a, a solemn place. It's, it commemorates the place where Jesus gave his life on the cross. So as I mentioned earlier, we go in through the entrance, we make a right-hand turn, and we go up a series of steps, almost like we're going uh, up a balcony. Uh, but really, it's a uh, small structure built over top of a limestone outcropping that for uh, many years uh, people have believed this is the location of Calvary going all the way back to the 300s AD. A beautiful uh, mosaic art depicting some of the scenes uh, surrounding uh, the death of Jesus on the cross. Uh, some of these mosaics uh, made of gold, uh, but certainly uh, beautiful uh, in their decoration. We're still in that upper balcony area, and here we are looking at a shrine with a communion table over top of the rock, the limestone outcropping, believed to be Calvary. Uh, there's a, a hole underneath the uh, altar, and where you can stick your hand down through there, reach in and touch uh, the limestone out outcropping thought to be Golgotha or Calvary. Plexiglass uh, over top of it so that you can see through it. Now we are uh, departing the uh, balcony area where there's the shrine to Calvary uh, that's underneath the plexiglass and underneath the uh, altar going down the steps. And as we uh, go down the steps, we're going to make a left-hand turn uh, heading uh, toward a marble slab, which is on the floor of the church. And this marble slab remembers the close proximity of where Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and then uh, prepared for uh, burial. That's what we're pointing at right now, the marble slab that commemorates that spot very sacred spot uh, for many uh, Christians. Behind it, there's a just a beautiful mosaic uh, there of um, the scene of Jesus' body being taken down and then prepared for burial with burial cloths and the spices uh, that are uh, used for his body. There's the picture of the mosaic. Sure, we can find a better picture of that gorgeous mosaic. All the little pieces of stone and metal. Now we're, uh, work, we're continuing to walk uh, to the left into the large rotunda area. And in this large rotunda area, we have a small chapel, small chapel called the Edicule. That's what we're looking at right now. And you'll see there are people going inside the small chapel. This chapel, the Edicule, is built over the location of the tomb of Jesus built over that uh, location. This is a very old structure uh, that was built over an even older structure. Archaeologists have even done some work here uh, and confirmed that there's a first century tomb here. Now we're continuing to walk around the edicule in the small chapel inside a just a really large uh, rotunda uh, you'll notice that in the back of the edicule, the small chapel, there's also a small shrine uh, here, and we're going to quickly uh, make a right-hand turn to look into the shrine. This is a shrine that's on the back of that chapel uh, on the other side of the structure uh, where the tomb of Jesus was. Now we're walking into a very old part uh, adjacent to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where uh, archaeologists have uh, found first century Jewish tomb. We're looking into that first century Jewish tomb, and what this tells us is that when this church was originally built by Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great, 
it was indeed outside of the city. Jewish tombs are always outside of the city. We are in the atrium of a first century Jewish tomb, uh, which tells us that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was indeed built over a, uh, uh, an area that was outside of the city of Jerusalem where all tombs were. So this church is built over a place that likely uh, would be a Jewish cemetery in the first century. Very old tradition related to this building as commemorating the location both of Calvary as well as uh, the place of the tomb. So it's suitable that I read from Scripture um, the account from Matthew's Gospel of the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus here uh, inside this church of the Holy Sepulchre. So let me read it for you from Matthew 27. As they went out, they found a man, Cyrene uh, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put a charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others but cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour... There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, The man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after the resurrection, into, they went into the holy city and appeared in many when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Joseph, the mother of the son of Zebedee. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus, and he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Story of the crucifixion and burial of Jesus read here in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Of course, the story of Holy Week uh, can't end just with the burial of Jesus after his death. Because we know from the testimony of Scripture that on the third day Jesus rose from the dead in victory. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 tells us 
that Jesus rose from the dead, and there were all kinds of eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul even says that we as Christians would be considered fools uh, if Jesus had not been raised because we have believed in something that's not true. But the testimony of Scripture is indeed true, that the Lord Jesus on the third day rose again from the dead. And so we worship a Christ who resurrected, the tomb is empty, and uh, the Lord Jesus has ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father. So praise be to God, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you.